Christmas, you're dismissed to go with Pastor Christina over to Children's Church. And while they're headed that way, turn with me over to one of those obscure books in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about a lady named Ruth this morning. Turn over to Ruth chapter 1. Pastor, that's a weird place to go on New Year's. Maybe. Let's see where it takes us. You ever heard the statement, or you've probably used this statement yourself, God moves in mysterious ways. Would you agree with that? You ever seen God move in some mysterious ways? You ever wondered, there's no way this is possible, and yet He does it. I love it when He does stuff like that. If nothing else, it reminds me that I am a nobody. And without Him, I am absolutely a nobody. But he does do things in mysterious ways. It's kind of like a, this lady that, her name's Margaret. Every Christmas she sent uh, gifts, some special gifts from, from the Americas to, to their missionaries that they supported through their church over in, in uh, Algeria. And if you know where Algeria is, it's, in the, it's on the edge of the desert. It's on the edge of the Sahara Desert. It's a pretty wasted land. And one year after the box had been put in the mail and sent and it was already gone, Margaret realized, I put my reading glasses in that box. Didn't mean to, but her best pair of prescription reading glasses she put in the box, and they're halfway around the world already, going their way to Algeria. Well, it wasn't just a couple of weeks later, she got a thank you card from the missionaries and said, thank you so much for the special gift. She said, the glasses especially were perfect. How in the world did you know my wife's prescription? <laughs> she can see perfect now. God does work in mysterious ways. <laughs> Even despite us, sometimes he moves in mysterious ways. He does it through events. You ever seen him do something in, a, in an event in your life that you're just like, wow. He does it through people as well. You ever seen him work through somebody that you would have least expected him to do something through? Raise your hand because that was you. <laughs> He's done stuff through all of us that we, we had nothing to do with. It's kind of the case here in, in Ruth. We're, we're going to read the first 20 verses or so of, of the first chapter of Ruth, and we're going to meet these ladies, Ruth and Naomi, and we're going to meet some guys, and we're going to see a circumstance, and we're going to see God doing some mysterious, thing, mysterious things and, and working in some mysterious ways. But first, let's, let's read it. Well, you stand with me this morning as we read here in the first part of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech. Aren't you glad we don't have some of the names they had then? And his wife's name was Naomi. Their two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were, Ephra they were Ephrahites from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died. And Naomi was left her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other named a woman named Ruth. Both about ten years later, or, or but about ten years later, both Malon and Kilian died also. This left Naomi alone, without her two sons and without her husband. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the land had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab and return to their homeland. Returned to her homeland with her two daughters-in-law, and, and she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down, and they wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, Why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters. Return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. And again they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth hung, clung tightly to Naomi. 
Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, there I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really Naomi? the woman asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara. For the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer? And the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by her daughter-in-law Ruth, the young Moabite woman. They lived in Bethlehem in late spring and and at the beginning of the barley harvest. And you can be seated this morning. So how in the world is this a passage about the Lord moving in mysterious ways? Maybe you've picked something out. I don't know. But let's start with Naomi. Let's talk about Naomi. First of all, she's moved from the promised land. She's moved from Judah. She, she's moved from her people to Moab. She followed her husband. Go figure. The times that, that this is in, the, it mentions there in the first verse or two, the times that, that they're in is, is when the judges uh, ruled, and it was a very, uh, a very harsh time. It was very destabilizing. It was a very unsettling time. So Elimelech, her husband, and Naomi... Uh, and their sons, they moved to Moab to try to find a better life. They were sojourners. They were, we might call them other words today and close the borders and not let them in. Think about that. But they were looking for a better way of life. Can we really fault them for that? Not really. They left their homeland, though. They left and went to this place called Moab. But that's a problem. Why is that a problem? What do you know about Moab? What do you know about this land? Where did it come from? What, what's, what's the, what are the Moabite people about? Well, let me give you a little history lesson. Go back to Genesis chapter 19. Let's take a trip back through history here for just a minute. I'll tell you who the Moabite people are. They're from Lot. They're Lot's descendants. Chapter 19 and verse 30, or 30 it tells the story of of Lot, and, and you remember Lot, his, they were in Sodom, and, and, and they, as they left Sodom, you know, he lost his wife. She's the one that turned into the salt pillar because she turned around and looked. So Lot's out in a new land with his two daughters, and his daughters were concerned because their mom was gone, and I'm going to give you the paraphrased version. Their mom was gone, and there was no bloodline to carry on from their dad. So they devised this plan. They got him drunk and they slept with him. That's just the simplest way to put it. The oldest daughter took care of dad the first night and the youngest daughter the second night and they got him so drunk that he didn't even remember it. That's pretty drunk. But that's who the Moabite people are. They're descendants of a relationship that was based on a lie, that was based on deceit, that was based on incest, and they were a people that were not even a blessed people. In fact, in Deuteronomy, it says, No Ammonite or Moabite of any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even to the tenth generation. Those are pretty strong words. When God himself says, You are so cursed, you can't enter the land of promise. The Ammonites were one of the daughter's descendants, and the Moabites were the other daughter's descendants. That's who these people are. That, uh, that Naomi and her family has gone and tried to establish a life with. You ever heard the phrase that the grass is not always greener on the other side of the fence? We just might be dealing with that case here. So as soon as they get there, Naomi becomes immersed with this ungodly culture. She, she uh, both her and, and they, they become, their, their sons become engrossed in this culture and take two women uh, Moabite women as their, their wives, and, and that breaks a bloodline right there. That becomes a problem in and of itself. They leave what they thought was bad to get to something good, and, 
and, and the circumstances begin to make it bad again. And then very soon after, Naomi's husband dies. Elimelech dies. And so now here she is stranded in this strange land. Here she is stranded with really no hope. She has her two sons. There's still hope in her two sons, but they've already married these Moabite women. In her mind, she probably has to be thinking, we've already messed this up. Have you ever taken a shortcut? How well do those work out for you? Guys, be honest with me. And yeah, I said guys, be honest with me. How many of you, when you open up something new, you take the directions and you go, and you just start putting stuff together? Hey, raise your hands because I know it's true. Jim's got both hands up back there. <laughs> Last night we were leaving the, the, the football game and the, the GPS in my brother's truck, we had to go 5.7 miles to get from the stadium to my car. The GPS said you'll arrive in two hours and ten minutes. It wasn't far from the truth because the traffic was so bad. So what did we do? We decided, hey, this can't, be possibly, can't possibly be right. If we go this way, we'll hit the interstate, and it'll take us out, and we'll get to this road quicker, and we'll get to that road quicker, and this won't take two hours and ten minutes. About three and a half hours later, I got to my car. Shortcuts hardly ever work. <laughs> they usually take longer. They usually cause us more problems, especially when our shortcut is our way and not God's way. Especially when our shortcut takes us out of God's will and puts us in our will. Hey, uh, I can amen that one. They don't often make life easier. They make it more difficult. Spiritually, they don't make life any easier either. They make it more difficult. This crucial decision that Elimelech made to lead his family out of the God-given land leads his family to destruction over the course of time. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen instantly. It, it, it happens rather slowly. Matter of fact, you, you probably know people. I know lots of people that uh, young people that, that graduate from high school, they grew up in church. You know, mom and dad had them by the ears and dragging them in every time the doors were open. You may have been one of them. I, that was my problem as a kid. Mom drug me in the doors whenever they were open. But what happens when you get that little bit of freedom? What happens when you go off to college? You, uh, <laughs> you get a little bit defiant. I don't have to go to church today. Huh. It's not the cool thing to do anymore. Matter of fact, all, of the, all the parties happen on Saturday night, so I'm going to sleep in Sunday morning so I can have a social life. And before you know it, you found yourself in that Moabite land, and you didn't mean to, but you drifted from what you knew to be the truth. You drifted from what you knew to be God's will, and before long you find that your shortcuts got you in trouble. Or how about this? Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a family that, that's, that's doing well. Financially, there's no problems, but they want to get a little bit ahead. They want to provide a little bit more for the kids. So what happens? Mom goes and gets a job. And before you know it, there's the pressure of having to do well at the job, and they need you to work on Sunday. They need you to work this weekend. Well, you can't tell the boss no, so guess what happens when you agree to work this weekend? It's not very long before you're working every weekend. And then guess what happens? I don't remember the last time I was at church. I didn't do it on purpose, but I wanted to take a shortcut to try to get to something better, and now I find myself spiritually drained because I'm dealing with the consequences of that. That's where we find Naomi here. It sounded like a great idea in the beginning to leave the land that was having trouble and go to this land that looked so promising. You ever been to Vegas? Man, when you fly into Vegas, on the way in, the lights of the strip light up everything. The pyramid has all these flashing lights. It even shines a big beacon straight up into the sky. It says, hey, here we are. Bring all your money here. That's why it's called Lost Wages Nevada, right? It looks good, but man, you don't have to get very far into it before you realize I'm losing my rear end. This is not good. Things don't always turn out to be as good as they first appear especially when we're trying to take a shortcut of doing it our way and not God's way maybe we should look at ourselves this morning Naomi finds herself in a pretty barren spiritual place she's finding herself her spiritual temperature is pretty low 
How's your spiritual temperature this morning? How's the temperature in your house? How's the temperature in your family? How's the spiritual temperature with your wife and your kids or your husband? Have we found ourselves getting into some shortcuts that we thought looked good, that have led us away from what the truth is? You know, there's nothing like a new year to try something new to restore what we know is supposed to be. You know, we really don't have to reinvent this. What keeps us warm spiritually has always been and will always be and is today, and it's staying right in the middle of God's will. It's doing what He has for you, doing it in His way. Does that mean life's always going to be easy? No. Matter of fact, doing it His way sometimes is hard. Doing it His way sometimes hurts. But man, the end results and the rewards are out of this world. We come up with all kinds of excuses that tend to lead to our spiritual temperature getting lower. All kinds of excuses that tend to lead to us finding ourselves in this wasted place. We use work and finances as an excuse. We use family as an excuse. We use all kinds of things. We allow busyness to become the thing that determines how we participate. Busyness determine is the factor that leads our lives. Our, 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 our need to, to be socially accepted leads our decision-making processes. And, and there's stuff that happens that leads us into this land of Moab. We don't mean to. It's kind of like an addiction. Roosevelt and I were talking about this this morning. There's no alcoholic that ever meant to become an alcoholic. There's no drug addict that ever meant to become a drug addict. There is no spiritually depressed person that was once up on the mountaintop that meant to get into the valley. It just happens that way sometimes. Because we start to make bad decisions. We start to take shortcuts. We start to do it our way and not God's way. But God can do some amazing things, even in the middle of that. That's where Naomi's at. That's Naomi's condition. She's lost her husband. She's lost her two sons. And now she has a daughter-in-law that all she wants to do is argue with her and cling to her. And probably driving her nuts. I told you twice to leave me. I am a miserable person. God has done something to me. It's always God's fault, right? You You ever been there? We've all blamed him. We've all said, what are you doing to me? That's where Naomi's at. You know, that's okay to feel that way. It's a natural reaction. It's a natural thing to put that blame on God sometimes. But how does this turn out? Where is the good in this? Where is, the, the, uh, where is God doing something miraculous and something amazing in all this? You have to look at Ruth's response. You have to look at how Ruth handles this situation. Now put yourself in her shoes. She's a Moabite. She grew up in this land. She knows the religious practices of the Moabite people. She knows, the, she knows how they do their rituals and, and their, their events of, of whatever their practices look like. This is home to her. For her to, to cling to Naomi and go back to Judah is a major no-no. She will not be welcomed. She knows this. She, there is nothing in Judah that would be accommodating to her because of who the Moabite people are. It's, it's just a political no-no. Don't do it. It's bad. But there is something that Ruth sees in the God of Naomi that she recognizes as being better than any circumstance she has ever found herself in. Think about that. I know I'm going to go and I'm going to get ridiculed. I know I'm going to go to a land where I'm probably not welcomed. But the God that you serve, even though you feel like you're miserable right now, is better than anything I have ever had. Do you know that is the same God that you and I serve? That is the same God that opens up His promises to us? The same God that asks us to come and be a part of Him? It's the same guy. Do you know how blessed we are? Do you know how fortunate we are? There are people all over the world that are looking for that, that God. There's people all over the world that are, that are putting their hope in something that is a lie. 
We were talking about a religion this morning that's a bold-faced lie that has people's attention. I, I don't get it sometimes. How can you put your faith in something that is known to be dead? How can you put your faith in something that you see time and time people dying with no promise of a, of a, of a future? How can you put your, your, your faith in something that is so empty? I don't understand it. When you have the Word of God that talks about all of the promises that we have, and if nothing else, even the trials that we endure here on earth, we have the promise of a life everlasting face-to-face -face with Him. Nothing else can offer you that. And I think Ruth saw that. And she realized, everything I have ever known is a lie. And I wonder if the conversation ever took place between her and Naomi where she asked Naomi if you realize how blessed you really are. Your little pity party's getting on my nerves. <laughs> you need to understand you are a blessed woman. You ever want to tell somebody that? I am sick of you griping. I am sick of you nagging. Your pity party's getting on my nerves. Get over it and get God. You ever wanted to tell somebody that? Try it. I wonder what'll happen. <laughs> Don't do it with a crowbar, though. You'll get yourself arrested. <laughs> Maybe we should stand out on the front. I don't know. Logically, it doesn't make sense for Ruth to go with Naomi. A lot of things that God does in mysterious ways and majestic ways are not logical in our ways. There's a guy named Balaam. You remember him? A guy in the Old Testament named Balaam that... that uh, well, his whole purpose in living was to rebel against God. And what happened to him? His donkey talked to him. That'll make you quit drinking. <laughs> That's not logical. God's ways don't have to be logical. Logically speaking, that shouldn't have happened. I've read story after story after story, and and heard all of these stories, especially listen to the, the testimonies and celebrate recovery and, and uh, some of our testimonies right here. Cases of, of, of sons growing up with alcoholic fathers that never once showed them who God was. Oh, but he claimed to be a Christian. I read a story of a, of a boy that that was his case growing up. Dad always claimed to be a Christian, but the the, the smell of the booze on his breath and the way he treated his family were pretty evident that he wasn't a Christian. But dad got saved one day. And the thing that changed everything is when dad came to his son and said, I need to apologize to you because I've not been the father that God called me to be. God works in mysterious ways. And you know the encouraging thing through all of that is it really doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what God you think you serve. It doesn't matter what religious leader you think you're dedicated to. It doesn't matter who you think you have to persecute. God still sent His Son to die for you. God sent a way to provide a miraculous thing in your life. There were 62 other thousand of my closest friends at the stadium with me yesterday. There was one behind me particular that overshadowed everybody. And it got louder as the night went on. And as the night went on. And I caught myself thinking about what I was going to preach this morning. And I, and I was wondering to myself, what would happen if I turned around and I told her, you know God loves you. I'm here today because I didn't do that. I'm not real sure what would have happened. But it's interesting when you're in, a, in an environment where there's that many people together. I was thinking, boy, could you imagine? Our church would fit in that little section in front of us. There's 62,000 people here. Could you imagine having an audience of 62,000 people to share the Word of God with? There's 62,000 people there that Jesus died for. You know the work is nowhere near done. There's a ton of Ruths out there in the world that are looking for Naomi's to be their example. Naomi wasn't exactly a godly example at this point. 
Matter of fact, Naomi was a very bitter woman. Naomi was a woman that wanted nothing to do with Ruth. Matter of fact, Naomi wanted nothing to do with God because he had brought all this bitterness on her. She lost her, her husband and her two sons and her home. And, and she's going back to this land that she didn't even know if she's going to be welcomed at. But even in the middle of that, there was something about her that Ruth clung to. Even in the middle of your bitterness, there might be something that someone would cling to when they see God. Think about that. Even in the middle of my bitterness, there might be somebody that can cling to something they see in God because God works in mysterious ways. Do you agree with that? What happened when they got there? We didn't read the rest of the book. But if you read the rest of the book, Ruth goes to work for this guy named Boaz. He takes them in, puts them to work, and, and helps them to reestablish. As a matter of fact, Ruth marries Boaz, and Ruth has kids and Boaz. And you don't think God works in mysterious ways? Go find Ruth's name somewhere else in the Bible. Turn over to Matthew chapter 1. Listen to this. A Moabite woman who was not even in the bloodline of the chosen ones. Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. And we know that Jesus is directly a descendant of the bloodline of King David. God works in ways that even put a Moabite woman in the lineage and listed her in the lineage of Jesus himself. You don't think God loves people enough to do amazing things through weird circumstances and through weird events and even through weird people? He does. He loves us enough to do that. He loves us enough, weird old us. He loves, loves us enough to even use us to make a difference in somebody else's life. Do you believe that? Has he used someone in your life to make a difference to you? Absolutely. We could probably go around the room this morning and hear testimonies of people in your lives that have made you who you are today. I could tell you two or three. None of them are with us anymore. But I could tell you two or three that have made me who I am as a Christian, made me who I am as a pastor, made me who I am hopefully as a father and as a husband. It can happen like that only because our inclusion in God's family is not based on anything we do. It's based on God's grace. There's a song we sing, His grace is sufficient for me. There's a little tag on it, even me. <laughs> Think about that next time you're at a place with a lot of people. Next time you're at Walmart. Next time you're at Kroger, next time you're at work, next time you're at the Liberty Bowl, wherever. God's grace is sufficient not only for me, but God's grace is sufficient for you and 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 even you and I don't like the way you look. Aren't you glad that we don't get to make the determination on whose grace God is sufficient for? We're to be a reflection of that. We're to be a reflection of His grace in the way that we love others. We're to be a reflection of His grace in the way that He loves us. You never know who's going to come to know Him because of your actions. You never know who's going to be led away from an opportunity to know Him because of your actions. Think about that. We've, we've sort of thrown Celebrate Recovery around a lot in the last... I guess, three months or so. And, and if, if it's a word that you're getting tired of, I'm sorry. If it's a phrase that you're kind of going, can we move on, this is Sunday morning, this is not Tuesday night, then I apologize. But I can't get over the words of what Pastor Lane at, at North Little Rock First said last month when we went to visit. We were sitting in a room of, I don't know, there was probably 25 people in that room. From all walks, you could smell the booze in the room. You could look on people's faces and know you're high. You could look on people's faces and know you're coming out of some kind of a bad thing in life. 
And Lane said right there in that room, this is what the church is supposed to look like. Think about that. The church should be full of a bunch of Naomi's. That something in life has happened and has caused them to maybe even hate God. Where else are they going to get the restoration if they can't get it in a place that shares that restoration? Where else are they going to get it if they can't be with a group of people that share that grace of God by the way we treat others? They're not going to. The sad reality is there's too many places that look down their nose at them. There's too many places that say, well, you're not welcome here this morning because we don't let people like you in. That's not church. Jim, I gave you a slide this morning. Can you, can you put that up there? We're toying with adopting this as our Celebrate Recovery slogan. But there's a lot of people that are stuck in this in life. Can you imagine if Naomi had allowed her struggle to become her identity? Can you imagine if Ruth had allowed her struggle to become her identity? She never would have been named in Jesus' bloodline. You know what that means? That means her son would have never been born. That means the line of Jesus would have stopped. Think about that. What's your struggle this morning? Are you allowing your struggle to become your identity? Are you allowing yourself to get so wrapped up in what life has thrown at you that you can't see beyond the realities that you don't have to get stuck there? That there's more to life? Has a decision that you've made got you there? Do you know someone that's stuck in their struggle. And that's what they've become, that their decisions have got them there. Stand with me this morning. I just wonder, has God got some mysterious event in the works for your life this week? Has God got some mysterious event in the works for the life of someone that you're going to come in contact this with, with some come in contact with this week? I hope the answer is yes. But as I looked around at those 62,000 last night, I would almost guarantee you that about 55,000 of them would raise their hand and say they're Christian. But I wonder how many truly are Christian. There's a lot of folks lying about that. There's a lot of folks that are comfortable in saying, yep, but the reality is, nope. we got to be the people that show that grace that brings them into that family of who God has, has asked, who God wants them to be a member of. What mysterious event does God have in plan for their life this week? Why don't you close your eyes? Bow your head and close your eyes this morning. I'm not going to ask you to come to the altar this morning. If you want to, you can. I'm by all means not going to tell you not to (laughs) but I want to give us just a few minutes to look inside take a look at ourself maybe maybe you realize this morning that you're a Naomi maybe you realize this morning that I've strayed away from what God had for me I strayed away from his plan And I've tried to do this thing all on my own, and it's becoming a shambles. It's falling apart on me. And maybe you need to do a gut check and step back into his light. Or maybe you're a Ruth this morning, and you're just clinging to whatever you can get a hold of because it looks better. Maybe you know the truth this morning, but you just can't quite let go of where you're at and grasp the truth. Would you, everybody's got their heads bowed and their eyes closed. If, if you're one of those two people, would you raise your hand this morning? And for no other reason, I just want to specifically pray for you this week. I'm not going to call you out this morning. But would you allow me to do that? Let me pray for you this week. That God would begin to open your heart, begin to open your mind, and begin to create those events, begin to put people in your life that are going to cause those mysterious events, those illogical events in our mind, but the events that will bring you back to Him. Is that anybody this morning? I've seen a couple of hands. Is there another?
And I want to ask you to do something. I'm not going to dismiss this this morning. You are. I want you to, uh, don't go far, but right there where you're at, grab the hand of a couple of people around you, maybe in the aisle there with you. You may not even know who they are. That's okay. But turn around and join somebody or reach up to the pew in front of you and just gather together right there where you're at. And I want you to just pray for each other. That in this new year, God would do some mysterious something in your life to bring you closer to Him. To bring you closer to the center of what His will is for you. Can we do that this morning as we dismiss? And I'm just going to let you do that. I'm going to go to the back of the room. And then I'll dismiss us here in a second. But be open with each other and just lift each other this morning.